Hello, everyone. Welcome back to round two here of our wonderful seminar, World War II in the Pacific. Um, before we begin, I wanted to just cue everyone into something that we have here at Carolina Public Humanities, and that is our Carolina Public Humanities YouTube page. And I believe my colleague, Paul Bonici here, is going to be opening up and showing us uh, what the YouTube page looks like. Um, so there you are. So uh, folks, we would love for as many people to subscribe to our channel as possible. Um, you'll notice that we have 216. We'd love to see that number keep climbing. Um, and what we have on our YouTube page are um, any number of programs. We do so many programs that are free for the public, for our teachers, for community colleges, um, and many, and just about all of those end up getting put on our on our YouTube page. Uh, this YouTube page is also where any attendee of our of our seminars, you folks here who are attending the seminar, will get a um, a pass for a blocked version of the video, which will also be on that YouTube site. Uh, so please, when you're at that video that you got sent the link uh, sent from us, or if you're just exploring our YouTube site, please subscribe. We'd love to have uh, more people watching all of this great content. Um, all of our lunch with friends and strangers end up on that uh, eventually. So um, and 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 we're going to be stocking that as we learn to do all of this virtual and video stuff. We're going to be stocking that with all kinds of great content. So I wanted to put that little bug in your ear. Uh, and let's get right back into what we're here for today, and that is Dr. Gerhard Weinberg. So one more time, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together for Gerhard Weinberg. Thank you. <clears throat> when we look at um, American strategy in the Pacific War, we have to first face up to the reality that our government, and particularly the President Franklin Roosevelt, took any number of steps to try to avoid war altogether. We, the president, invested an enormous amount of time in negotiations with the Japanese. Yes, the United States would provide aid to China as it fought for its independence against Japan. We would aid Great Britain as it defended itself against Germany. And after the Germans invaded the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, we would aid the Soviet Union. And if one asks what's going on here in these endless negotiations, well, the President of the United States, assisted by Secretary of State Cordell Hull, is talking and talking and talking and talking uh, to the Japanese at a time when the Germans, when the Hitler government, and to some extent Mussolini in Italy, are pushing the Japanese, go, go, go. It's uh, the hope of the American leadership that at some point the Japanese will see that Germany is not guaranteed to win the war that it is fighting. In this race between Hitler pushing the Japanese and Roosevelt stalling over a period of practically a year, Hitler wins by one week. If the Japanese had waited another week, they would have seen in the defeats of the Germans on the Eastern Front in December 41, and the British successful offensive against the Italians in North Africa at the same time, that the belief of the Tokyo regime that Germany was guaranteed to win the war was no longer so. And they might very well have decided not to go. But as I said, Hitler won this race. And the Japanese did attack and draw us into the war. And Germany and 
Italy immediately joined, and three other European countries, as I mentioned, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria also joined. And while the United States then declared war on Japan, Germany, and Italy, the president couldn't see what on earth the Hungarians, Bulgarians, and Romanians needed a war for. For the first time in history that I know of, he instructed our State Department to try to get the, uh, those countries to withdraw their declarations of war. And that went on until June of 1942. And then the president gave up the if they can't live without having a war with us, we'll declare war to them. As far as Japan was concerned, from the very beginning, the government, the leadership, and the American people were determined to crush Japan. Obviously, one of the first obligations was to defend the Philippines, but uh, in part because of a couple of mistakes uh, MacArthur had made, uh, that ended in early May of 1942, and the Japanese had controlled it. But we would also defend Australia as the Japanese moved towards it. I mentioned my prior lecture, Battle of Coral Sea. We, uh, in fact, lost one of our aircraft carriers and another was damaged. So from the tactical point of view, the Japanese came out ahead, but strategically they lost because they had to give up their effort to take Australia when they could not seize Port Moresby. The reason that after the victory at Midway and our successful defense there, we went into the Solomon Islands and had, as I mentioned, the longest battle of American history in Guadalcanal. It was not because Americans were always interested in Guadalcanal. 99.9% .9 of them had never heard of it, and I am sure the percentage is close, if not quite so high, today. But the reason for this offensive, the first in the Pacific War, was because after, when the Japanese took over here, that cut our communication to Australia from which we would have to move north to attack Japan. It was not, in other words, that Guadalcanal itself was so interesting to Americans who neither knew nor cared about it. It was the strategic issue of the Japanese taking the island and starting to build an airport there and generally interrupting our communications to Australia. Furthermore, we would also continue to help the Chinese. And as the Japanese advanced, excuse me, I have to get the right, what, what is this thing? Oh, there. As the Japanese came to control Burma, what we did was build and use air bases in India to fly uh, 
supplies into nationalist China. And this was called the hump. It was not easy or particularly effective, but it had two important aspects. Number one, we did get some supplies to the Chinese. And number two, the psychological impact on the leadership, particularly Chiang Kai-shek, the leader of the nationalist Chinese, that we were serious about defeating the Japanese. Nobody else would have dreamt of flying supplies day in and day out over the highest mountains on earth with substantial casualties occasionally along the way unless you really, really wanted to. So uh, that was a part of this. And in addition, as the road from northern Burma into nationalist China was taken over by the Japanese, we began to build a road called the Lido Road from a town where it started, again, to get supplies to the nationalists fighting the Japanese in China. Again, it's perfectly reasonable to argue uh, that the investment was in not exactly in proportion to the results. But again, one has to see this in its psychological and political contexts. There was also, and I may come back to this, a military aspect. By supplying the nationalist armies in China, we hoped and continued to hope into 1945 to the end of the war, in other words, that the Japanese had to keep the majority of their army busy in China. And by definition, that meant they couldn't use that, those same forces to fight American armies. And one has, in discussing American strategy in the Pacific War, the supply effort to keep the nationalist Chinese going has to be seen as a way of diverting as much as possible of the Japanese military force away from where we, our forces, had to fight them. And of course, it worked. Uh, the Japanese continued to fight in China. And as I mentioned in my prior lecture, launched several big offensives there, especially one in 1944. And so this aspect of the supply which is sometimes criticized as being disproportionate in cost as compared to what was actually delivered, one has to, in my opinion, also see it as a way of supporting the diversion of Japanese forces from places where they would have been assigned to fight us. The basic strategy that we adopted in order to defeat Japan was a double thrust across the Pacific. Let me see if I can. One across the Central Pacific, 
to Japan, and, and then the south west this away. The first, the Central Pacific under Admiral Limits, and the Southwest Pacific under General MacArthur. An admiral on the first one and a general on the second. Now, there has been, and I suspect will continue to be, a good deal of debate among both military people and historians as to whether this two-thrust approach was wise. It certainly cost a great deal, but I think one has to admit that it also had very considerable advantages. It made things much more difficult for the Japanese if and when they were success, near successful in one area, the Americans would push in the other. And on a number of occasions during the war, after the American victory at Midway, when this two-thrust operation went forward, uh, we managed in one because we were doing so well in the other. And on the whole, it does seem to me that in practice, this double thrust worked. This gives you the immediate area and it's just hard to say whether the advantages outweighed the disadvantages. But there can be no question that it caused enormous difficulties for the Japanese who numerically were in a difficult situation and after Midway were never able to rebuild their navy the way the, way the United States was able to both repair and rebuild its navy. The long-term expectation was that either from here or from here we would get into these islands down here and bomb and eventually invade Japan. But that meant in the first instance we had to capture islands that uh, were within uh, range of Japan, just a minute. I having some trouble getting the These islands, Saipan, Tinian, and the Marianas were within range of Japan by 1943. The United States, in its effort to build bombers that, if necessary, could bomb Germany, had decided to do this in two stages. 
First, a improvement on the B-17, the flying fortress, that could be a kind of super fortress. This became the B-29. And by the time in 1943 the B-29 was available, we had bases close enough to Germany that they were all sent to the Pacific. And from these islands in the Marianas, they could reach Japan. We would therefore, as I said, land there in, the, in June of 1944, a few days after American and British forces landed on D-Day in Normandy in France. Having successfully conquered these islands, we then decided to go for Iwo Jima, not because we thought they were such a beautiful island that we ought to have it, but rather because it was closer to Japan and was one way in which fighter planes could escort bombers to parts of Tokyo, to parts of Japan. And we would then go to Okinawa and in a three months long battle took that island again, not because we wanted that island, but because it meant that from there fighter planes could escort the bombers that headed for Japan. It is in this context that one needs to consider what the Americans had in mind vis-a-vis -vis Japan itself. In the first instance, as I've already mentioned, in November of 45, we were going to land on the southern home island of Kyushu. From there, fighter planes could support the main invasion planned for the spring of 46 in Tokyo Bay. What one has to remember is that the planning for Olympic was exclusively American, and only American troops were going to land on Kyushu and occupy it and set up bases. The second one, the one scheduled for the spring of 46, Tokyo Bay, was the initial force would be American, but there would be British and French troops in the follow-up because it was assumed correctly that the Japanese were going to do what they possibly could to uh, beat us and crush this invasion. Furthermore, this operation was to be assisted not only by the continuing fighting in China, but the Soviet Union would come into the war and attack here, the southern part of the island of Sakhalin, would invade Manchuria and would invade Korea. In other words, between the Chinese and the Russians, the vast majority 
of Japan's forces would, to put it not very politely, busy elsewhere. And uh, what tends to be overlooked is that the United States was urging the Soviets into the war. And General MacArthur, who was appointed by uh, the new president, Truman, who took over after Roosevelt's death in early April of 45, to command the invasion uh, of Japan, kept reminding President Truman how important in his opinion it was that we get the Soviet Union into the war. There was another aspect to American strategy for the Pacific War that needs attention. We had originally in a race with the Germans, uh, but in cooperation with the British, were building, a, developing and building atomic weapons. It was in July of 45 that we tested the first one in New Mexico at a time when President Truman was on his way to a conference in, by this time, surrendered and occupied Germany. The United States and Great Britain had not only cooperated in building this device, but had also agreed that they would use atomic bombs that they would use atomic bombs only by mutual agreement. We got the agreement of the British to use them on Japan. And Truman was informed, actually, on his way to this conference at Potsdam in Germany of the successful test in New Mexico and told the British that we were about to use them and told something about them to Stalin, the Soviet leader who was there. Truman did not know that Soviet espionage in the United States and Britain had kept Stalin involved about the progress uh, that we were making on the atomic bomb. But as soon as Truman mentioned to Stalin this great new weapon, Stalin encouraged him too to go ahead and use it on the uh, Japanese. In the summer of 1944, there had been discussion in the White House of targets in Germany for when the bomb was ready. But by the fall of 44, it was obvious that Germany would be defeated, most likely, before we had any of the new weapon. And under those circumstances, there was planning for these bombs to be used on Japan. The concept was as follows. We would drop one on a Japanese city. If the Japanese government did not react to this by surrendering, we would drop a second one on another Japanese city. But we would not drop a third one on a Japanese city. Any 
that became available in the fall of 1945 would be saved up, number three, four, five, etc., for use in support of Operation Olympic in November when, as I mentioned, we were going to land on Kyushu, the southernmost of the home islands. And it is worth noting that when General LeMay, who was the commander in the Marianas who sent the bombers, uh, asked about number three, he was immediately instructed both orally and in writing that he was under no circumstances to send number three to another Japanese city. In the course of deciding where to send them, there had at one point been the proposal that one of the first two should be dropped on the uh, old former Japanese colony of Kyoto which is around here, but Secretary of War Stimson, in my opinion, very wisely, had that struck from the list of cities. And on that, the president upheld his position. The issue of morale, which the Japanese had, as I mentioned in my prior lecture, uh, considered central, was only in a minimal way present in American troops in Europe. Those who were there and were beginning to be shipped back in anticipation of using them in Japan there were some morale problems. But the basic issue of using American troops in the home islands and in the process most likely uh, suffering substantial casualties uh, was just simply not working. That's all there is to it. Uh, the plans of the Japanese, as I mentioned, were for a defense of the home island if Japan did not surrender after the first two. Number three, was connect and, and four, five, six, and so on, were in American planning tied to Operation Olympic. Now, there has been in this country very considerable discussion back and forth about the casualties that the United States and also, of course, China, Russia, Britain, and France would suffer if the war had continued. I frankly don't want to get into that debate. Uh, my brother, who is a year and a half older than I am, was in one of the units scheduled for Olympic, and uh, I would have been in coronet. What we do know is that on the Japanese side, estimates on the casualties were not in dispute, but unanimous. 20 million. That needs to be seen in the context of what actually happened. The first bomb, as I suspect many of you know, was dropped on Hiroshima, a city 
around here in central Japan. And the second was sent, dropped on Nagasaki down here in the south when the Japanese did not surrender after the first. But when the second one was dropped, Within the Japanese government, there was a division. Half of the top council figured we'd better call it quits. They thought we had, the U.S. had an indefinite supply, would be able to kill practically everybody in Japan, and didn't need to invade. And then the other half was of the opinion, we'll go on with it. Let them come. Let them drop whatever atomic bombs they want to drop. We're going to fight to the bitter end. <clears throat> in the even division in the governing council, Emperor Hirohito was called in or brought in and ordered the surrender. There was then an attempted coup by military to overthrow the government and continue the war. Ironically, one man played the critical role in this not coming off. War Minister Anami Kurochika had been one of the half who wanted to go on with the war, but he had been in the room when the Emperor <laughs> resolved the equal division. And in the conflict between what he wanted to do lead the coup against the government. And his loyalty to the emperor, he had been physically present when the emperor called for surrender. An army committed suicide. And the coup attempt, though it killed a few people, failed. And Japan was surrendering. The, there's an aspect to this that doesn't generally get discussed. As I mentioned, there was debate about American casualties if the war went into the home islands, the campaign. And the Japanese had decided that 20 million Japanese casualties was okay. A few years after the war, General LeMay, whom I mentioned who had been in charge of the dropping of the bombs from the Mariana Islands, who had stayed in Japan and was helping a little with the Japanese, was given the highest medal that Japan can give to a foreigner. And to the best of what I've been able to learn, Nobody objected. Nobody had anything against this, in public at least. Maybe while there was this debate, and still is, as to what the American casualties would be in a fight in the home islands, the Japanese had decided the two atomic bombs on Hiroshima Nagasaki killed the wounded approximately 250,000 Japanese. But if you use your higher mathematics, this saved the Japanese 19,750,000 casualties. And that may, I'm speculating please, may have something to do with the fact 
that when the man in charge of this, General LeMay, is given the highest medal Japan can give to a foreigner, there was no uproar or sub opposition. The next lecture will be about the British strategy, but I want at this point to mention, bring in a very important act of the British that had a lot to do with what happened after the Japanese surrender. In the discussion of the Japanese surrender as they headed that way in August and September of 1945, it was proposed that the surrender be signed by Emperor Hirohito. It was the British who argued very strongly that someone designated by Hirohito should sign the surrender rather than humiliating the emperor himself. This argument was made sufficiently strongly and effectively that it prevailed. And if you've ever seen or looked at one of the many pictures of the surrender ceremony on the American battleship Missouri in Tokyo Bay, you will see that it's not the emperor signing the surrender, uh, it's Japanese foreign minister uh, Shigemitsu Mamuro. That, it may be worth considering, has at least something to do with the very nice way in which the surrender was followed by a very quiet occupation. The United States occupied most of the home islands, but there was a British zone of occupation roughly from here to here. In other words, this area was occupied by a British force. And in the American occupation, and that tends to be overlooked both in the history and in the discussion, was much calmer, much pleasanter, much shorter than what happened in Germany. In the German occupation, American soldiers carried weapons, carried arms. In the Japanese occupation, American soldiers didn't carry arms. There were terrible incidents in, the, in occupied Germany. There were such incidents in occupied Japan. The whole thing, the whole operation, went much more quietly. It is true I don't want to omit this, that a number of high-ranking Japanese military committed suicide after the surrender. But please note, the suicide means they killed themselves. It took a while for some of the Japanese troops to surrender, but they didn't fight anybody. They just held out and eventually surrendered without shooting. And the occupation ended in 1952, uh, and not, as in Germany, much, much later. And so uh, we have to remember that the surrender rather than in Japan as contrasted with the earlier that year surrender of Germany, took place before the homeland was invaded 
And unlike the head of the last German government, Admiral Dönitz, Hitler's successor, who in late May of 1945 was arrested, Hirohito, the emperor of Japan, was not arrested and unlike Dönitz, was not tried. And the whole country was not fought over the way Germany had been. And one could argue that from that perspective, the combination of the American strategy with A-bombs and the British insistence that the emperor not be humiliated created situations which were both for the occupation and the people there, a very, very much better situation. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Gerhard. We have lots of questions coming up. Um, an, another excellent presentation. Let's start right out with a question from uh, Jackie Posner, perhaps Jackie and her put this question together. Hello, friends. Uh, the question is, was the duration of the effort in New Guinea the longest campaign of the war, and was the invasion of the Philippines strategically necessary? The, the, the fighting in New Guinea, the first part, just a minute. I'll use this one, was a landing here at Buna and Gona, and then a couple of places. If we were going to have two thrusts towards Japan, there was, in my opinion, no way to avoid a going this way. Bases like Hollandia, Sansapur, which is here, and, uh, and then Borneo. And the issue of the Philippines is a very difficult one. This was American territory after the Spanish-American War. It had been under American control for several decades. It was headed for independence. The idea of it being under Japanese control for a long period of time was something that not only General MacArthur, who had been in control there and wanted to go back, but lots of Americans felt very badly about that. Whether that campaign which started in October of 44 uh, at Leyte Island and then moved on up eventually uh, to Luzon and then also to clearing up the southern islands. One can argue that maybe we shouldn't have, but uh, the idea of leaving these people whom we controlled for decades and we headed towards a new independent country to leave them under Japanese control which was very, very, very evil in which there were lots and lots and lots of atrocities whether we should do that, that's a very difficult point. We did it, and the final decision on that was made in July of 44 at a meeting in Hawaii where President Roosevelt went to meet with Nimitz, the commander of the Navy, and MacArthur, the commander of the Southwest Pacific. And one can argue it, but it's not difficult to understand why Roosevelt eventually decided, let's try to liberate the Philippines. And please remember that at the time that that decision is made, 
and October of 44, when it is implemented, we have no atomic bombs. We are planning an invasion of the Japanese home islands, of which the main central part will begin in March of 1946 to leave the Japanese in control of the Philippines, therefore, has to be seen not as from the end of 44 to the fall of 45, but from the end of 45 to some time or other in 1946 or 1947 or 1948. The general, it's interesting, for example, that Winston Churchill, who until the summer of 45 is the Prime Minister of Britain and Minister of Defense, he was quite clear in his own mind that the war would last till 48. And British military prep preparations looked in that direction until it ended, as we well know, very much earlier. But it, one has to keep in mind then that the Japanese, that the Filipinos would have been under Japanese control several years more than we now know they would have been uh, now that we know about the atomic bombs ending the war in 45. Thank you for that uh, thorough answer. Um, and uh, th I also want to thank Jackie for being one of our board members. We have a lot of board members uh, uh, chiming in here on our advisory board. And I believe this is Ann Lemon, also a board member, chiming in with this question. Uh, Guadalcanal ended in February 1943. The other island battles seem to have started up in the spring of 44. What was happening during the rest of 43? Sea battles? Uh, during the rest of 43, there were a, summer, a number of sea battles. It is also in May of 43 that our forces, uh, excuse me, uh, retake Atu in a very bitter and bloody campaign, and then we plan together with the Canadians to take the other island for their out Kiska. But when we get there, we find that the Japanese have left. So there's that fighting. And there is, in that period, fighting here on the north shore of New Guinea. So there is both naval fighting and other fighting after February of 19. Uh, 43, when <clears throat> the uh, Japanese pulled their last soldiers out of Guadalcanal. Thank you for that, Gerhard. Um, we have a question here. Um, again, I love seeing all these names. It reminds me of what it's like to actually be in a room with all you people. Trisha Topping writes, hello, Trisha, writes, uh, did the Japanese really expect the Soviet Union to abide by the Soviet-Japanese pact? Well, they thought and hoped so. They had fought Russia once before. And then they had had a number of uh, local fights with the Russian, with the Soviet Union. But they also knew that there was all manner of friction between the Soviet leadership and the British and the Soviets and the Americans. And they also were quite sure that Stalin wanted to expand Russia. He, he had done it first in alliance with Hitler and was now doing it in alliance with the British and Americans. Maybe there were things in East Asia that the Japanese could promise him. Why not divide China with them?
the way once upon a time he divided Poland with Hitler. There were all kinds of possibilities, at least, the Japanese hoped. And they furthermore realized, they knew, and this was entirely accurate, that the Soviet Union had had tremendous losses in their war with Germany. Way over 26 million dead. There's an argument whether the figure is 27 million or 28 million or 30 million, but it's an enormous casualty rate. That with that behind them, did they really want to have millions more fighting the Japanese again? And uh, one has to see it uh, from the Japanese perspective as something that maybe we could buy them off. All right, great, wonderful question. We have a question here from Alan Roberts, a little detail on the Philippines. Uh, Alan would be interested in your thoughts about General Sharp's surrender of his forces on Mindanao in May of 1942. Would keeping that force fighting have tied up Japanese forces we ended up engaging during the Southwest Pacific island hopping? Our forces in the Philippines in 41, 42, operated on the principle, we will defend as much and as long as we can. And just as uh, on the northern island of Luzon, our forces went into Bataan Peninsula, fought there until April, and on the island in Corregidor in the Manila Bay till early May. Mindanao, the other, the next biggest island, uh, we were going to, the forces there and the commanders there were going to fight until, of course, General Wainwright in May had a general surrender. But uh, one has to see this in the context simply of troops defending the places they've been assigned to. Would there have been any benefit of holding on beyond May of 42 in Mindanao, in your opinion? It might have discouraged or reduced the Japanese forces uh, available for the expansion into the southwest. Uh, keep this in mind always that the majority of the Japanese army at all times is in China. And so whatever else anyone el elsewhere can make difficulties in holding them, uh, that is affected by that kind of holding. Thank you for that uh, thorough answer. Uh, we have a question from Katie. Uh, what is your opinion on Hiroshima and Nagasaki being chosen because they were economic centers versus being military centers? Did we bomb a military target or an economic target? They were not only economic targets, they were also military targets. Uh, Hiroshima had the headquarters of the Japanese army defending that central part of the island of Honshu. Nagasaki was an important naval and munitions place. So these were not just if you will, purely residential areas. They were picked as sort of medium-sized cities that were also, that were both civilly and militarily important. And Kokura, another one city on the list that didn't get an atomic bomb because 
the weather wasn't right, uh, the same thing was true. You had fa factories in the cities as well as people. That was a characteristic feature of the Japanese economy. And they were also, that is, uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki picked because they had been bombed some before, but not a great deal. And so the impact was likely to be greater and more likely, therefore, uh, to have the Japanese government decide to call it all off. Thank you for that. Um, Bob Warren, who has spent some time uh, scuba diving in Truck Lagoon, where apparently there are over 100 sunken ships with even some Zero fighters, has a question about that site. Uh, the US attack on Truck Lagoon has, uh, he believes, has been called the Japanese Pearl Harbor. What is your assessment of the importance of this attack, military or psychological victory, or both? Well. It was a major Japanese base, and for quite a while, we bombed it from the air as we would any base. But then in the last part of the war, really went after it, both for military purposes and to show the Japanese government, whom we would like to see surrender, that there was no place on Earth that they could really effectively hide from us. That question. Um, and uh, Bill Williams asks Was there much public discussion in the United States of the Germany first strategy, or was that conversation limited to high levels in the government and military? The idea of Germany first was not much discussed in this country. It was decided, practically speaking, before we entered the war formally, in negotiations between British and American military in 1941, that if the US was brought into the war, we would put Germany first. Keep in mind that the two major allies that we had after December 41, had no choice in the matter. For the British, the Germans were, so to speak, across the street, the other side of the English Channel, 20 miles away. And the Germans had artillery there that quite literally fired over the Channel into England, even before their V-1 and V-2 rockets and missiles were landing in England. The Brits had no choice. The Russians didn't just have the Germans at the front door. They had them inside in the main bedroom. The Germans had broken into the Soviet Union. So uh, from the American point of view, it wasn't that the Japanese were exceptionally nasty and had attacked us in this terrible way at Pearl Harbor. We realized that our allies had no choice in the matter. And that therefore, while we would fight the Japanese, to be sure, and eventually turn to offensives in the Pacific. We would have to put the majority of our forces into the European war because that's where our allies had to keep theirs. They had no choice. Now, they may have had choices as to exactly where and how. The British, for example, much preferred fighting from the Indian Ocean than in the Pacific. And the Russians, of course, waited and had told us that three months after the Germans surrender, they would go to war with Japan. 
but because they were busy with Germany. But uh, we, if you will, adjusted from the beginning our strategic priorities to the realities of the situation. A question here from Jerry Everhart. Uh, could you comment on the advantages and disadvantages of the lack of a U.S. United Command in the Pacific? Well, since we decided, wisely or unwisely, on this double thrust across the Pacific, which would make it very difficult for the Japanese uh, to defend against both. Uh, it did not seem to people in Washington to make sense, at the top, that is, the president, to have one person in charge of everything. The one person in charge of everything was Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, who under our constitution is the commander in chief of the armed forces. And that is why in, I guess it was July of 44, he met with Nimitz and MacArthur, as I mentioned, uh, and decided that we would go into the Philippines and eventually Okinawa and not Taiwan. So there were major decisions made by the supreme commander. But given the big size of the area and the variety of issues, the concept of two uh, thrusts separately commanded, Nimitz, Admiral Nimitz, General MacArthur, made a good deal of sense. For that answer, um, Alan, Robbins, Alan Roberts asks, was sustained naval blockade and conventional saturation bombing of all food production within Japan evaluated as an option uh, to invasion of the home islands prior to the successful test of the nuclear bomb? Uh, and he also asked, did B-29s have the range to the northern islands from Okinawa? pushed by naval leaders, but the whole question was as to how long would this take? And what all awful things would the Japanese be doing in the areas they occupied during those additional years? And while we did not know that the Japanese had leadership had unanimously decided to accept 20 million casualties in an invasion, that tells us something as to how long they would have just stuck to it if we had just bombed and blockaded. The top American leadership, and this means primarily uh, Harry Truman, who took over in April of 45 when Roosevelt died, was that we need to get this over with. And the person who presided over our Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Leahy, <coughs> excuse me, tended in that direction too. And it just at the time, it uh, looked like the right thing to do, and then substitute the atomic bombs for the invasion. And that, of course, ended the war much more quickly and with many fewer casualties on both sides uh, of the war. question uh, and, and well for the answer. Uh, Bob Warren asks, it seems that the policy of unconditional surrender played a major part in strategy for the whole war effort. Uh, 
Were alternatives to this policy considered? Unconditional surrender what had been proposed by some in 1918. President Wilson, uh, Prime Minister Lloyd George of England and Clemenceau of France wanted to end the war which had gone on too long and one of the people who argued for unconditional surrender was the Assistant Secretary of the Navy, American Navy, a man by the name of Franklin D. Roosevelt. But he kept quiet as a loyal member of the Wilson administration. The issue of unconditional surrender was discussed in 1918, both publicly and within governments. Since the Germans maintained afterwards that they really hadn't been defeated, there was general agreement that this time they're going to be having to surrender absolutely and be occupied so that they know that they were defeated and hopefully would not try a third time. In the case of Japan and the other countries, the general sense came to be, well, uh, we don't want to do this all a third time. So we would enforce unconditional surrender on all of them, except, if I'm not mistaken, Romania, which switched sides in August of 44 and then fought on the Allied side against the Germans. That's another story. Finland, I don't think, had to either. But they worked, yes, that's correct, Finland and Romania. But in the case of both Germany and Japan, the concern was that if they don't surrender, who knows what in the future Somebody there will tell us, tell those people, tell the Germans, tell the Japanese, you weren't, we weren't really beaten, so let's try it again. And uh, the leadership, and in this regard, I think the public was behind them, figured, we're going to show those guys this time, and nobody's ever going to argue again that we weren't defeated. And of course, without an unconditional surrender, please know, there wouldn't be occupation troops in the whole country. Everybody in Germany who survived at some point saw Russian, French, British, or American troops. Everybody in Japan who survived, got to see uh, there were American soldiers and British soldiers everywhere. Nobody could argue, we weren't really quite defeated, so let's give it another try. And as everybody knows, it's been a good many years now, uh, since 1945, and neither the Germans nor the Japanese, as a public, have been enthusiastic about starting another war. In this regard, I think the German example was the most important and influential. People tend to forget that in his campaign for office in Germany, Hitler always called for more wars. And that in a country where something slightly in excess of two million soldiers had died in the war, First World War, this would become in free elections, the largest party in the country, was something that had a lot of influence on the thinking 
of the leadership in this country and in uh, Germany and somewhat more reluctantly the Soviet leadership came around to it. Thank you for that. Folks, I'm afraid we're at the end of this section. We're going to keep questions up, of course, because we can always ask questions outside of our time. I do want to remind folks to put your questions into the uh, Q&A button at the very bottom. They get lost in the chat, and so if we put them in the chat, we might not see them. So I notice a few questions in the chat already. If you want to, in the meantime, put those in the Q&A. We will get to those uh, at the end of our next session. Uh, so let's put our hands together for Gerhard Weinberg. Gerhard, can you hear the clapping? <laughs> They're all clapping. Um, and we are going to take a longer break here, an hour break, so that everyone can get lunch. Uh, and we'll see you back here at 1.45. Thank you so much.